My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program on behalf of the Souza Mendez Foundation. I'm so happy you've joined us for an hour of your Sunday, and today is our final program of our spring season. Then we will be taking a break for about a month, and we will see you after the 4th of July for our programs in July and August. For the past year or more, we have been featuring beautiful stories of rescue, resistance, and hope. We at the Sousa Mendes Foundation honor a hero, Aristides de Sousa Mendes, who saved many lives during World War II. And today's beautiful film, The Rescuers, features the story of Sousa Mendes, among a dozen other rescuers who also acted according to their conscience and in many cases against the direct orders of their government in order to save human lives. And it's so important to remember these heroes. Today, we are privileged to have the director of this beautiful film, Michael King. We also have the producer, Joyce Mandel. And in addition, we have the historian, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, who is our resident expert on the board of directors of the Susan Mendes Foundation. And formerly for 24 years, he was at Yad Vashem where he directed the Righteous Among the Nations department. And he oversaw many of the cases that are presented in this film today. I, I have a co-host for today's program. He's Frederick Hayat from the Karl Lutz Circle in Switzerland. Although today he's coming to us from Greece, which is wonderful. And you will be meeting him and our speakers in just a little while. But before we turn to our speakers, I'd like us all to see a clip from this beautiful movie. And it's the clip of the Turkish diplomat in Rhodes. My father was told over and over again to stop giving these passports and helping the Jewish community escape the island from Rhodes to uh, Marmaris on the Turkish coast. It was the 18th of February, 1944. My mother was uh, upstairs in the residence uh, writing letters to her mother and to her sister and she was uh, nursing a cold. And at that very moment, two uh, planes came and flew over the consulate. Thereafter, the planes made a tour and passed over again, flying very close over the roofs. German planes. We need to go. We need to go. Huh? Now. My mother was thrown to the ground uh, and uh, she was unconscious. When she came to himself, she saw nothing but dust and rubble. Her maid was lying dead only a few feet away from her. And uh, my father called down, Mihri Nisa, Mihri Nisa, that's my mother's name. There was no answer, so uh, he, he became almost hysterical. He ran into the rubble and uh, he pulled her out and uh, carried her to the hospital, but the Germans had strict instructions not to allow them so fortunately, he knew uh, some doctors on the island. He took uh, my mother to their house and they took care of her wounds. She somehow knew that she was carrying a boy. That was me. So uh, my father uh, spoke with the doctors and they said, well, we will try to save, of course, uh, both the patient and, and the baby. So I was born on a Saturday and she died the following Saturday. First of all, thank you very much for attending this afternoon. It's very important that we continue to tell this story. Um, the story about the diplomat from Turkey that you just saw is a wonderful story, um, but they didn't all end that way. I wanted to just go back for a moment and talk about the way that uh, Michael King and I came together to make this uh, film. Uh, I am a Jewish woman, 
Um, but in my family, um, they came to the United States quite early. And so we never had any discussions about the Holocaust. We discussed World War II because my father fought in the service, but we were three girls, three daughters, and um, my parents didn't feel that it was a, a good idea to talk about the Holocaust. So I never heard about the Holocaust. And then I never heard about it in school either. And it wasn't until many years later when I went with a friend of mine who's sort of a hobbyist historian and we went to Ellis Island. I had never been to Ellis Island. And there was a photography exhibit there called um, Passports to Visas for Life, Passports to Freedom. And it was about diplomats and there were photographs and you could walk by, there was nobody speaking but you could walk by and you could read about these diplomats and what the, they had done and the courage that they had. And I was just fascinated. Just thinking, why? There was no diplomat that was Jewish. Those diplomats and most diplomats came from wealthy, educated, non-Jewish families. And they came from different countries. And I wondered why would a Japanese diplomat who had never met a Jew ever um, risk his life and his career um, to save Jews. And when I came home, when I came back to Connecticut, I called Michael King. Michael was a good friend and we've worked together uh, producing documentaries, mostly about social justice. And I said, Michael, I think it's really important. I had an experience today I wanna to share with you, which I did, I won't go on, but Ultimately, we decided that it would be really important to make a film about diplomats that rescued Jews during World War II, and we went forward to do that. Um, it wasn't easy. We started in 2008. Um, we had a lot of uh, foundations and museums and individuals who were interested in supporting us. And then there was the crash, and they went away, and the money went away. And Michael and I decided, you know what, we're going to have to go forward. I talked to my family. Our family said, we're in, let's make this film. And so that's what we did. And in 2008, there was nothing virtual. Michael and I had to travel by plane and we traveled by car and we traveled by train to meet uh, families of diplomats and to be in the countries where this took place. And it was fascinating. And I hope that um, everybody has, um, everybody who has seen the film enjoyed it. And those of you um, who haven't are going to see the film and will enjoy it. Important stories to share with your families and the people that you know. This uh, film has gone around the world and um, is now going to be a permanent collection at the Shoah Foundation in LA. Facing History has been um, showing it. Uh, teachers are taking clips and using it to educate children. It really has um, gone on to have a life of its own. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm always happy to talk about the rescue as I feel like it's my baby. Thank you, Joyce, for these uh, interesting comments. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce the second clip of this afternoon dedicated to Carl Lutz. My name is Frederick Hayat, and I'm the vice president, vice president of the Carl Lutz Circle, a Swiss-born initiative that aims to promote the legacy of Carl Lutz, a Swiss diplomat, writers among the nation, who saved tens of thousands of Jews in Budapest by, among other actions, giving them letters of protection. As other diplomats in other countries, like Aristides de Souza Mendes in France or Sempo Sugihara in Lithuania, Kalut put all his diplomatic talents and power to service his conscience when he was serving in Hungary. Together with other diplomats, such as Roald Wallenberg from Sweden or the Apostolic Nuncio Angelo Rota or Friedrich, Friedrich Born of the Red Cross, Kalut severely hindered the Nazi death machine. Kalutz, in his previous diplomatic posting in Palestine, represented German interests. Using this fact as leverage in Hungary, where he represented, amongst 
other countries, the United States of America and also the United Kingdom, he was able to confront Adolf Eichmann and the Hungarian authorities and managed to negotiate under pressure the registration in Budapest of 76 buildings as Swiss territory to shelter part of the Jewish population or otherwise promised a certain death. Unbeknown to his own government, he issued collective passports for the Jewish population giving a virtual Swiss identity to tens of thousands of people. In spite of the ex this extraordinary humanity of these uh, gestures, Carlos still remains unknown. At the end of the war, as other diplomats, Carlos was expelled from Hungary by the Russians. As a new world started to emerge, his story was of no interest to anyone. It has to be said that unlike almost all other diplomats who helped the Jews, Kalut was not dismissed, but he suffered all, all his life from the lack of recognition of his motherland. Kalut Circle was behind the initiative in 2018 to name the largest conference room at the Federal Palace in Bern under the name of Kalut's in memory of the action of the Swiss legation in Budapest during the war. More recently, no later than last week, the United States in, a, in addition to having financed a memorial in front of its embassy in Budapest in 2006, inaugurated in the same embassy a room in memory of Karl Lutz. Let's now have a look to this second clip, which includes a moving testimony of Agnes Irchi, the stepdaughter of Karl Lutz. Two foreign diplomats undertook to issue a protective document stating that the holder of this document were protected by that country. Those two diplomats were Karl Lutz, the Swiss consul who was representing British and American interests in Budapest, and newly arrived the day after the last deportation from Hungary, Raoul Wallenberg. The senior Vatican representative in Budapest, Angelo Rotta, from his office on Castle Hill, brought together all the diplomats, all the ambassadors of the neutral countries who were still represented in Hungary because Hungary was independent. And they, between them, took buildings, largely in the area of Posonyi Street, what they called the international ghetto, modern apartment buildings. And on more than 100 of these buildings, they put their respective national logos, their national insignia, Swedish, Swiss, Vatican. This was a collective act of diplomatic rescue, unique in the history of the Holocaust, and indeed unique in the history of diplomacy in any conflict. And they stood here, and they were shot, and they, they fell into the water. So if one person was badly blessed and the other less, they, the other person dragged them down so it was it's a very a very cruel thing and my father noticed on that special evening in november that a young woman was still alive her head came up again and again but of course he he couldn't help her here so he asked his chauffeur to follow the woman down the danube here and uh, my father and the chauffeur dragged her out somehow and uh, put a sheet around her. And as we heard later, she survived. His motivation certainly was his religion, that he had the feeling he had to do this here in Budapest, even though it was not the type of job which he would normally have done. But his conscience said to him he had to do it. Hello everyone, my name is Michael King. I'm the director of The Rescuers. Before I talk about The Rescuers, I'd like to thank Olivia for her support of the film and leadership of the Susan Mendez Foundation. I'd like to thank also her host, Frederick, and Mordecai, 
Mordecai, last time we met, we were at the Yeshiva University on a panel discussing the rescue, rescuers, and that was eight years ago. So it's always a pleasure and privilege to see you. And I know Sir Martin Gilbert, who passed away, I think in 2015. It was basically right after we st stopped filming, he had an accident who I still miss, to, miss today very much. And he educated me in terms of the diplomats, in terms of the Holocaust, and helped me, helped me in terms of telling the story by his narration. And to the Andrew J. and Joyce D. Mandel Foundation, I've known Joyce Mandel for almost 30 years. This is our fourth film together. And her and Andy and her family have been a major influence in my career and also in my life. And I'm deeply, deeply indebted to them. And uh, there's not enough to say about what they mean in my life and also their commitment to make the world a better place by the stories they tell, what they do in their communities and what they do internationally. So Andy, if you're out there, thank you. All right, uh, the rescuers, the rescuers. You know, when Joyce told me about this story, I was thinking about, I said to her, let me think about this. Let me do some research because I really didn't know much about these diplomats. So like every documentary I do, I do extensive research. And that's how I met Sir Martin Gilbert. And I thought internally for myself personally, I said to myself, how many people do I know in my life that would risk their lives, their families, their careers and go against their country policies? And the answer was none, none. And I said, they deserve a spotlight. Their story deserves to be told. And it's not just about their stories. It's about the fight for humanity the fight against crimes against humanity and what they did for the Holocaust. They didn't have to do that, but they did. And a lot of them had to pay a price for doing that. They were drummed out of the diplomatic corps. Some of them died penniless. So I'm really honored to be able to have told their stories met the survivors, met the relatives of the diplomats, traveled the world and been able to reflect on this very special, special action. Now, Joyce and I, Joyce, thanks to Joyce, we decided that we we're gonna go ahead and pursue the other rescuers that we weren't able to show in the film. So there's 30 more diplomats that are righteous. And right now we're in the process of researching, looking for survivors, looking for relatives of diplomats. So if it, anyone out there know of survivors that were rescued by diplomats, please contact Olivia or go to the rescuersdoc.com and let me know where we should go, how we should reach out and who they are. I wanna say this, um, it's painful. It's painful for me as an artist, as an African-American that have, has seen 
racism that has seen discrimination. To see we're in the 21st century and we're still facing these issues of social injustice. Now it's time for us, the audience, myself and others to, that to take control of this. We have the moral authority and power to make a difference. These diplomats did that 50 years ago. I would like to see that we break the cycle of genocide, break the cycle of crimes against humanity. And all of us are responsible. So on that note, thank you very much for watching The Rescuers. And I'll be, I'll be around later to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Michael. And I'm going to now introduce the next clip, which is about Aristides de Souza Mendes. So, in one of the in the clip that we're going to see from the film, um, you will see Souza Mendes's grandson, Sebastian, who is now deceased. He was a, an art professor in Washington State, and he was very devoted to telling his grandfather's story. He was one of the founding board members of the Souza Mendes Foundation back when we began in 2010, Sebastian Mendes. So you will see Sebastian walking with Sir Martin Gilbert and with Stephanie, the Rwandan anti-genocide activist, and they're crossing the border between France and Spain, but not the, the normal border that the refugees crossed in 1940. They're crossing the border at a little mountain border post because what happened was, Susa Mendez came to the normal border and people were not being allowed to cross. His um, visas that he had written in these refugees' passports were not being honored at the border because the Portuguese government had, had in coordination with the Spanish government, had uh, arranged for the, the, the Spanish border guards to not let these people into Spain and then on to Portugal. So they were not being allowed to cross. So Susan Mendez, like the Pied Piper, took the group that he found there of hundreds of people. And he brought them up to this tiny little mountain border post where there was no telephone. And he persuaded that border guard to let them cross. So this scene uh, that we will see takes place at that little mountain border post. So let's see the clip. So here we are at the border, the old French side, and we walk up, and here is the actual line that divides France and Spain. We stop for a moment on the French side. If we're caught here, the French gendarmes take us down to prison, to camps, and from there, two years later, we're deported to our deaths in concentration camps in German-occupied Poland. We cross the line, and we're in Spain safety, life, hope. Mm. And your grandfather, in his car, his last journey across the border, takes the risk, the real risk, because the Spanish guard is armed, that he will drive slowly, and the refugees, weary from this terrifying walk up the mountain, follow mm. to safety, to hope. Well, and I was remembering also that the guards were first looking at him, and then they looked, and they did a double take, and they had quite an astonished look on their faces. And just as those who crossed here, they were safe, and yet the future was still uncertain. What would become of them in Spain? Would they be able to leave Europe forever? That's right. And similarly for the refugees today, mm. they cross a border, they're in safety, they're in refugee mm. camps, and yet the camps can be raided, yeah. their safety in the camps mm -hmm. can, is always in doubt. Right. It was an uncertainty with every right. step, right. Right. but every step forward was a step further away from where they'd been. Right. right. After the war, his government simply was not interested in what he had done. Indeed, he was punished for disobeying the orders not to give the visas. My grandfather had come from a, an old noble family, but the consequences of what he had done 
ended up driving him into pretty much abject poverty so he couldn't really support his children any longer and they were forced to leave the country but they all knew that what he did was something great and necessary. Am I right that he ended up at a soup kitchen? He had no f money, yep. no wind to feed himself? Yeah, there was a uh, Portuguese Jew named uh, Isaac Bitten and he said that as a young boy he saw my grandfather there and he could tell that he wasn't a Jew and he approached him and asked, uh, why are you a, a non-Jew here with the refugees? And my grandfather said to him with a smile, I too am a refugee. Dr. Paldiel, what would you like to say? I came to Yad Vashem in 1982 to head a department called The Righteous Among the Nations. Uh, I studied uh, and I was instrumental in honoring many non-Jews who uh, single-handedly uh, saved Jewish lives. And then I came upon the story of uh, Susan Mendes, who had already been honored by Yad Vashem, but the story was not known, it was not told. It was simply on the file. And I was astounded. Uh, the story of Susan Mendes is so different, so unique, even from uh, the diplomatic point of view, because he saved thousands of people single-handedly. He didn't have a team of associates. He didn't have secretaries. Most other diplomats, they, they had people that were working in tandem with them. Okay, Carl Lutz, uh, Raoul Wallenberg, and so forth. But uh, Susan Mendes did everything all by himself. Uh, and so that was highly unusual. The second thing was that he was told by his government. He was a Portuguese diplomat stationed in Bordeaux, uh, a, a large city in Southern France. And he was uh, told by his uh, government. The government of Portugal was headed by a man called Zalazar. He was a president, he was also the foreign minister. So he was the direct superior to Sousa Mendes. And under a certain circular that was sent out to all diplomats, they were told, no transit visas were to be issued to Jews. Okay, underline to Jews, period, under no conditions. In June 1940, the German army was storming through France. On June 10th, they had entered Paris and they were on the way down to Bordeaux. A lot of people, mostly Jews, but not only Jews, who had reasons to flee from the Germans came to Bordeaux and they wanted to get to Lisbon, which is Portugal because Lisbon, big city, a big uh, harbor, and where they were hoped uh, to board a boat and escape from Europe. But to get to Lisbon, they had to cross into Spain. And to cross into Spain, they had to get a transit visa from, Port from, from, from Portugal so that the Spanish authorities would allow them to cross. And this is who the Mendes comes into, into play. Sousa Mendes, uh, his background, he was a conservative. Uh, he believed that Portugal would best be ruled by a king. He was a monarchist. Uh, he was a regular person. Uh, and uh, he had a long diplomatic career behind him. He was a few uh, years away from retirement. And here he is in Bordeaux as a consul general. And there are thousands of people flocking into Bordeaux ahead of the German army, which was on its way down. The French government was about to collapse and be replaced by Pétain. And these people are standing in front of the Portuguese legation in Bordeaux and asking for a transit visa. Uh, but he had orders not to issue any. Well, one day he took a trip uh, in a car uh, to see all these people that were stranded on the streets and he saw a rabbi with a long beard. And something mysteriously attracted him and he, he stopped the car and then asked the rabbi, why don't you come over to my office? Let's talk things over. I want to hear from where you are and what's happening. So the rabbi told him that uh, he, he's desperate. He wants to get to Portugal. Uh, Susan Mendes said, well, I'm sorry. I can't help you. I have orders from my government. I can't issue any visas. So what happened for many hours, the rabbi sat there with Susan Mendes and after the rabbi 
Nobody knows what went on in the conversation. Susan Mendes went into seclusion for two days, and then he decided, I am going to disobey my government, and I am going to issue visas, whether people can pay for that or not, to anyone asking for it. And he asked the rabbi to help him out with stamping the visas. And so here is a story quite unique. Here is a man with 13 children throwing his career to the wind, knowing that there will be consequences. He will not only lose his job, he will only not lose his pension and retirement funds. He may be imprisoned. He may even be shot. We are talking about Portugal, a dictatorship, a man, Zalazar, proto-fascist. But uh, he becomes a man possessed, Susan Mendes. And he decides, I'm going to help these people. Later on, he explained to the rabbi, he met him again in Lisbon, and he said, I'd rather be with God against man rather than to be with man against God. And then he gave another explanation. If so many Jews can suffer because of one Catholic, having in mind Hitler, it's okay for one Catholic to suffer for so many Jews. It's quite unusual for a man not known for anything outstanding humanitarian in his past career. Uh, as the film also showed, he was so, much, so possessed that he not only did he grant the visas, but he wanted to make sure that these people would be allowed to cross because uh, the Spanish authorities had alerted the Portuguese government and the Portuguese government told the Spanish, stop the people from crossing if they have a visa stamped by Sousa Mendes. So he took them to another place where, as the film showed, and as uh, Olivia explained, they didn't, they, they didn't have any phones at that spot. And then he helped them to cross into Spain. From Spain, they headed to Portugal, to Lisbon. And from there, eventually, uh, some of them made it to the United States and to Latin American countries. Of course, he was brought back and placed on the disciplinary conditions. He was tried, found guilty, fired all of his pensions, all of his money were taken away from him. And he had 13 children. And the children, some of these children suffered very much. Uh, some of them left Portugal, some of them came to the United States. They were helped by the highest Jewish organization. Uh, and he himself was down to, uh, to uh, uh, having to have his uh, dinners uh, at a Jewish uh, soup kitchen, uh, which was funded by the uh, JDC, the Jewish, uh, the Joint Distribution Co uh, Committee. He died, a poor man, in 1954 and was forgotten. He was honored by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations. But then he, the story again was forgotten when I came to Yad Vashem. And I was asking, where are all these people, these thousands of people who were helped by him? Where are they? How come they're not interested? They don't talk. They don't identify themselves. And what about the tree that he deserves to have at Yad Vashem? According to regulation of Yad Vashem, the tree has to be planted by either the honoree or those people that he saved, but nobody was coming. So I decided to violate a regulation and I planted the tree myself at Yad Vashem at a choice spot, at a good spot where people could assemble and gather and talk about the story. And then later on, thanks to uh, Robert Jacobitz, the story began to spread out. And finally, the Portuguese government, Salazar was dead. There was a new government, more uh, left-wing. Uh, the government recanted and restored all the rights of Sousa Mendes uh, that had been taken away from him and restored it to his children. But that was not enough. And so I want to point out the lovely Olivia Mattis, who created a member of her family, was saved by Susan Mendes, and she decided to create an association and call out and spread the news. And before miracle of miracles, a lot of people came and said, I, my, I was helped by Susan Mendes. And here's the proof, here's my passport, and here's his visa. And so now we have several hundred names, and the story spread out, and he has now become a national hero of. Portugal. Uh, the story, you know, there are many aspects to the Susan Mendes things. First of all, 
it was a lonely job. It was done by him alone. He did not consult with anything, not even with his family. I'm sure they had, he asked his children whether to do that, to disobey his government. They would have said, dad, please don't do that. But not to, you wanna help, help one or two people, but not, but not more. Think about us. He did not consult. Something happened to him and he decided, and once he became possessed by that, he went out on a limb and he helped so many people, mostly Jews, but not only Jews, people who had reasons to flee from the Nazis, such as the crown prince of the uh, former Austrian um, uh, empire. Uh, and uh, the, the thing about Sousa Mendes and all the rescuers and all the diplomats, after they did what they did, they felt so good about what they did. They had no regrets. They felt that this was a proper thing to do. They felt that they fulfilled themselves. They, ful they gave meaning to their lives. They discovered their true self. None of them, neither Susan Mendes, nor Karl Lutz, nor uh, the other diplomats ever said, oh, maybe I should not have done it. Maybe I should have been more careful. They felt that helping other people to stay alive was the most saintly thing that a person can do uh, in one's life. And that's why we can associate with these people and we can show people that you don't have to be a cut out saint at the start in order to do a saintly deed. You start with one step and then you expand and then you find out you can do so much more. So that's all I have to say for now about Aristides de Souza Mendes that has a beautiful square now in Jerusalem, not far from Yad Vashem. And that's thanks to you, Dr. Paldiel. It was your effort to get that square and we're all eternally grateful to you. Thank you. So let's start by throwing out two important questions. Number one is, what is the mystery of goodness that's spoken about in the film that Dr. Sir Martin Gilbert mentions in the film? Is there such a thing? And then I'll give you the second question as well. And all three panelists can chime in on whatever you'd like. The second question, which is also brought up in the film, has to do with diplomats today. We meet a Polish diplomat who is talking about the action of Slavic, who paid with his life for his action, and who's saying that there is a lesson from these diplomatic rescuers of the Holocaust for diplomats today, and that is that they that when there is danger, the diplomats need to exceed their authority, I guess it is, and act. We also meet another diplomat in the film, a German diplomat stationed in Copenhagen, who says that diplomats are limited to the realm of words. And you see Stephanie not quite sure that she believes that or agrees with that. So let me throw out both of those questions to our panelists, the mystery of goodness and what is the responsibility of diplomats today? The, the official responsibility that's given to diplomats and is that different from their moral responsibility? Olivia, I'd just like to um, follow up on this conversation that Stephanie had with a German consulate when he said to her, young, a young man, just starting out in his career and said to her, what can I do? I am working for my government. There are policies in place. What can I do? He said, what can I say? And what can I say to you? And Stephanie looked him straight in the eye and she said, you know, there are times when what you say, words really matter. And what you don't say, that matters too not speaking up and doing the right thing. It was so brave of her. After all, we were in his offices with all of the uh, German you know, uh, heroes of the German Reich, pictures of them still on the walls. And I thought it was really brave of her to say, and he had no answer. I'll follow that up by saying that we did a screening 
at the uh, UN and we did the screening for diplomats. And there were 80 to 100 diplomats that were there and they listened very, very intently and they were very quiet. We had the same thing happen. Uh, we were in Europe doing a tour and diplomats coming. And I have to tell you that nothing has changed. For the moment, there's an energy. Uh, Michael, you can step in and um, you know add to this if you want. We always feel when we come out that there's an energy and that there's going to be a change. Um, the same thing when we work with people from the State Department. Um, everybody agrees, you know, that the idea that racism and that um, understanding history and trying to make a difference is important and especially important for people who are in positions of power and can do it and it doesn't change. Michael? I'll build on that and say, did they have to do what they did? Probably not. Why did they do it? Why were they compelled to do it? It goes, I think it goes into their belief system. And I think it goes into being a humanitarian. I believe it, it's because they wanted to make a difference. And they were few. That's the mystery of good, goodness. It's because they were few when there were so many, so many that died, so many that looked on and did nothing. But why not now? Why is it different now? Why, why is it too? That you can point at, and we didn't even talk about Canadians, right? I think it's, I think it's so much easier to watch than participate. I think diplomat, the diplomatic structure, the way it is, does not encourage diplomats to take action without. Mm -hmm. without authority, without giving, without getting the permission from, from their boss, from their leaders, etc. Sometimes you just have to do the right thing. You can't wait for someone to say what we all know inherently is the right thing to do. Dr. Paldiel? I would like to add something. I have a different perspective about this, about the mystery of goodness. All of us live lives, we have a, we go through life and we have a lot of negativity within us. Uh, you know, according to Sigmund Freud, we are basically only interested in our own well-being. We have a lot of aggressive instincts. We are all neurotic. We don't care about the others. The basic philosophy of Sigmund Freud and the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, the whole bunch of philosophies that promote self-indulgence and uh, self-development. That's Western society. There is, when, when you, when you, when you uh, examine the acts of uh, these diplomats, they came face to face with people who needed to be helped. They saw the pain in these people's eyes. They showed that these people needed to be held and that they, the diplomats, could make a difference. In other words, in that moment, they were, they were playing God. They could say, yes, make it possible for these people to continue to live, or they could say, I'm sorry, I can't do it, and that would doom these uh, people. I think that all these uh, diplomats that helped, uh, they were able to diminish the self-interest, this negativity, and allow some of the goodness to come out. Uh, and that, is, that is the mystery of goodness. Goodness can come, it's there. All you have to do is remove the roadblocks, the negativity, okay? For instance, take Susa Mendes. He had to forget about what would happen to him, his pension, his children, his family. Very difficult decisions. 
And he probably, at the beginning, he was only interested in helping the rabbi and his family. The rabbi said to the diplomat, no, don't only help me. There are th hundreds and thousands of people outside on the streets. If you want to help me, you got to help the others. And here, this was a challenge to Susan Mendes. And when the rabbi left him, he went into seclusion for two days. And he decided, I will do it. Because God is calling me. He was a Catholic. There are some who claim that Sousa Mendes felt that he had some Jewish blood from way back, from hundreds of years, uh, when Jews lived in, in uh, Spain and Portugal. But he was a devout, devout Catholic. And he felt that this is God calling him and saying to him, now you're being tested. Let's see if you can stand up to the test. And he did. So I'm saying not everybody has to be a Sousa Mendes and, and throw caution to the wind and, and help thousands of people and throw his whole career. But everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. And you don't have to be a, a Mother Teresa. You don't have to be a Francis of Assisi. I say to Christian people, one story told by Jesus, the story of the Good Samaritan, one lonely had such a great impact on Christian thinking. You can be just a lonely, good Samaritan who saved one Jewish life. But it's being told and retold in all the churches of the world. And I think it had an impact. So I, I say, unfortunately, genocide still going on. Today in China, the Muslim community is being persecuted. Things don't change that fast. But now we have examples from the righteous among the nations and from the diplomats. In other words, we can show people, it's not theory, it's not something. Karl Marx sat in the British Museum and he came up with the idea of a communist society. It was theory, it was fantasy. It turned out it doesn't work. But here we have examples of people who did acts of goodness. It worked, they saved. These are real examples. And these are people that we can associate with because they are not Francis of Assisi. There were regular people who were, each one went about their business, their diplomatic business, and yet they found a way to help others. So we have these live examples and all we have to do is spread these stories. And therefore, thanks to you, Joyce Mandel and Michael King for the film, because it helps to spread the story and it shows that you can do it. You can be a savior of life. You can be a creator, a recreator of life. It can be done. So I think over the long run, it will have an impact. Now, here's a question for Michael and for Joyce having to do with Stephanie. Yes. So the question is, first of all, how did you find her? And that it, uh, her story brings such a dimension. In fact, we would like to know more about her story. And what is she up to now? Um, so, so I'll start about Stephanie. Um, Michael can talk about how we, how we found Stephanie because um, that was all about Michael wanting to find a Stephanie. Stephanie um, was Rwandan. Her family and her village was completely destroyed, genocide. She was rescued by some missionaries. There were five, there were, she was one of five girls. I think she was 10 years old at the time. The missionaries who took her across the border into, um, Michael was a Burundi that they went? Congo. They went to the Congo and these missionaries um, had ties to the United States and um, gave Stephanie and her sisters the opportunity to go get to the United States and not just get to the United States, but get a good education. She um, ultimately went to the Kent School in Kent, Connecticut. And uh, from there, she graduated and she went to NYU, got her undergraduate degree and then her master's in communication and ultimately um, became the communications director for Paul Kagame, who was the president of Rwanda. 
Stephanie suffered and, and it was traumatic for her, as you can imagine. She was there to see her grandmother shot. We have um, part of that story um, in the film. So she is an anti-genesist today. Um, she works hard um, and she has been in Darfur and in other countries working hard to try to bring some sensibility uh, to people. She has failed and um, keeps saying to us because of the travel that she took with us because of her relationship with Sir Martin Gilbert, which was very close. Um, where are the rescuers there? Where are the rescuers in her country, in Rwanda? And then of course, as other people are saying, just where are the rescuers, generally speaking, everywhere? So Stephanie today is uh, back in Rwanda. Um, she has uh, four, uh, she was one of five, she had four sisters. Well, they're all doing something great. They're in Atlanta, United States, teaching there in London. Um, one became a physician. Um, they understand the value of education and they've made it through and they're going to make the world better. We had Stephanie in Hartford at the University of Hartford because they had a, um, a large, considering the size of the school, contingency of Rwandans who had come over to learn some um, discipline and um, to become better educators back in their uh, country. And Stephanie came to, um, to talk to, to, to talk to them. So she's trying um, she's trying and, and somebody was just saying here like Susa Mende, one you know one lone person, you know, not a lot of support, just keep moving forward and, and trying to do the right thing. So I guess that that that, that would be Stephanie. And Michael, I don't know if you have something to add. You can talk about how we found her. Well, like Joyce said, it, uh, Stephanie is an anti-genocide activist. I thought it was important not to just talk about the Holocaust, but also talk about other genocides and have a face that represented something a little more current. Mm -hmm. And they got together. You know, I think it's important for the younger generation for us to educate them. And it's a lot easier if we have somebody that represents that generation that they can see themselves in. Stephanie lost a hundred members of her family to genocide. There were very few rescuers. She's fought very much against genocides, crimes against humanity. She met Sir Martin Gilbert. They really, they hit it off. They liked each other. Their message was similar. So we decided that she would be part of the team. And I'm, I'm glad, even though it's provocative, to bring in other genocides in relationship to the Holocaust. But that's a risk I took. And I think, if everybody sees the film, I think that it makes it a modern day contemporary story. And what a collection of earrings she has. Yeah. Every scene she has different earrings. Thank you everybody for all those uh, very interesting uh, questions. Uh, I wish we, we had more time to continue, but it's time uh, to conclude. And I would like to turn the floor uh, back over to the three panelists and ask them for their final remarks. So maybe I'm going to turn to Joyce um, for your final remarks. Well, thank you for that. I guess um, I would just wrap up by saying this was such an important um, day. I was happy to meet you all. I hope that this conversation um, has brought some additional thoughts about what it is we can do, other outreach, that we should be thinking about. I'm certainly hoping that the people who attended this um, learned something. There were a lot of questions coming up and it's from the chat room. Um, I don't think we have time to answer everything, but we can take those questions and be thinking about it. And I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to be a part of this. Thank you, Joyce. Michael? 
Well, thanks. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, spending an hour with us. I, I hope that we provoked some thought about the mystery of goodness, the banality of evil, and what we can do individually to make a difference. I also want to say, I'd like to thank, again, the Mandel family for the opportunity for our new project, Rescuers, the Last Chance Project. We're about to lose a generation of survivors. This is our last chance to document the survivors' stories, and specifically in relationship to the diplomats that saved their lives. Everyone out there, if you know of any survivors, any relatives of diplomats, please go to rescuersdoc.com or go to the D'Souza Mendez Foundation and we will reach out to you. It's very important for us to document this generation's story. All right, so thank you very much for giving me your time and uh, hopefully I'll see you another time. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Padiel? Okay, what I have to say is the Holocaust, it's such a terrible infamy, such a terrible story on the annals of humanity that it tends to, people, to, to put people off because you don't know what to do with that. It shows man at his worst. And so the tendency is not to deal with that to overlook it, to put it away, and maybe to forget about it, which would be a great sin. The way to overcome it is to show that there were people who stood out against the Holocaust, and these are not people with guns and machine guns in their hand, these are rescuers of lives. The Nazis wanted to destroy lives, and the people in this film that we saw are people who protected and maintained lives and it can be done. So we can teach the story of the Holocaust via the story of the diplomats. Take a story like Karl Lutz. We can teach what was happening in Hungary, most terrible human types of behavior by Hungarians and Germans. And then we have Karl Lutz who saves. So we can tell the story of the Holocaust and we could make it more acceptable by showing that there is a difference. People can make a difference. That's why we have to tell these stories. That's number one. Number two, all people who work for governments, diplomats or non-diplomats, they have to follow regulations, which is linked to their jobs, but they are also universal laws of morality and ethics which go above and beyond. And so the story of the diplomat is that every diplomat, there comes a point where a diplomat has to either to disobey or to, 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 to finagle around the law in such a way that he is disobeying the law in fulfillment of a higher standard, of a higher law, of a universal obligation. And this is what the diplomats did. They disobeyed in order to save human lives, in order to be in accord with the universal standards of civilized life, the sanctity of human life. This is all what, what it's all about. So this is something, this film should be shown in the halls of, uh, di of diplomats. It should be shown, I think the State Department has to show this, that there comes a time when a diplomat can say, should say, I am sorry, I cannot follow that, that regulation. Uh, because, not because I'm a humanitarian, but we, there are humanitarian laws which go above and beyond the laws of my, of my assignment as a diplomat. And I am obligated to these universal laws as well. So that is the importance of this film and the importance of this message. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paldiel. Uh, as a conclusion, I would like to thank the three panelists. 
uh, and the Susan Mendes Foundation for having brought tonight to life the actions of all these uh, diplomats and for bringing each of their stories to the public thanks to this wonderful movie, The Rescuers. Um, as a final remark, I, I would like to share with you two quotes. Um, the first one uh, is a quote from a Jewish lady that was rescued by Karl Lutz and who said, a question will remain until the end of my life. Would I have had the same courage as Karl Lutz to save the Jews in Budapest and risk my life? And the answer to that question is probably no. And the second quote is from uh, Karl Lutz himself. Uh, the laws of life are stronger than the text of laws. And when so many countries break the laws to kill, there might be one who break them to save people. Olivia, I turn to you. It's a privilege to present stories like this. And I'm grateful to our speakers and our audience who comes week after week. And now we'll have a break of a few weeks, but I hope to see you back here in July. So uh, enjoy the rest of this day and thank you for being here. Bye-bye everybody, bye-bye.